The Red Spinner Coupe, often referred to as the Deckard Sedan, is one of approximately five of this style of picture car that were built by Gene Winfield of Winfield Rod & Custom for director Ridley Scott's future noir film, Blade Runner, released in 1982. The five coupes, which can be identified on screen, were painted in the following colors. Red, blue, green, and black, all in civilian form, as well as a white car with a police livery, the last of which is the only other car whose fate is known. The film had the relatively unique distinction of having an exceptional number of bespoke vehicles made for the production, 25 at the most recent count. Cars figure prominently in the film, as well they should, given that it takes place in Los Angeles, California, a place synonymous with automobile ownership, just as New York City is with public transit. Formerly on permanent display at the American Police Hall of Fame and Museum in Miami, Florida, in 2019, the car moved to the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, California, as part of their Hollywood Dream Machines exhibition of iconic picture cars from science fiction film and television, not coincidentally the same year that the original Blade Runner film takes place. The coupes were built on the chassis of then-contemporary Volkswagen Super Beetles. Winfield used the Beetle platform for movie cars beginning with Blade Runner as they were air-cooled, economical, and could sit idling for hours between takes. An interesting thing worth noting is that upon reviewing Winfield's film credits, this was the first and largest film contract he had gotten, with his previous cars primarily being one-offs and powered by monstrous American V8s. Also, they were existing builds, which were written into shows and movies rather than being built expressly for them. The Red Coupe was built with 70s film stocks in mind and is light on certain detail, like the interior, which featured some random decals and a display of geometric curves, likely meant to represent mileage, acceleration, and temperature. It was also built with a tight budget in mind and was likely completed before Winfield had a sense of how the cars would be used, as it has no weather stripping to speak of on any of the windows or windshield, nor did the budget stretch to include a functional windshield wiper. Upon viewing the gaps between the windows and pillars, this must not have been fun for the drivers during filming in a future version of Los Angeles beset by climate change. The vehicle has undergone at least one repaint in its lifetime, as evidenced by the change in color to the E-pillars, and the paraphernalia in the rear pit area, meant to portray the car's propulsion system, has changed. The various items, often referred to as Greeblies or Wiebelfetzers, were most likely removed and reinstalled with a bit of artistic license, and from sketchy memory by someone, probably at a body shop, after the repaint was finished, as they do not quite match what we see in the original film. It is apparent that to capitalize on its law enforcement heritage, I'm making air quotes as I say that here, and to remind people that it was used in Blade Runner, the Police Hall of Fame had additional badging and graphics added to the car in the form of stickers saying police, and also the number 56. None of these graphics are visible on the car in Blade Runner, nor any of the movies or photo shoots it was known to have been involved in in the intervening years between 1983 and circa 1992 when it was moved to Florida. The Peterson attempted to lean into this, and on the placard describing the car, they said the character Decker drove a special stripped-down police vehicle with guard wheels, traffic lights, and impact bumpers, which were added for ground traffic based on the existence of the white police livery version. Under scrutiny, this reasoning does not hold up, given the prevalence of this style of spinner and civilian specification throughout the movie and Deckard's seeming contractor status relative to his relationship with Bryant and the LAPD. And regarding the contractor status, I know it's been 40 years, but I'm still not going to spoil things for anyone watching this anyway. If you haven't seen the film, you really should. What is more likely is that this model of spinner is the fictional future equivalent to the Ford Panther platform, that is to say, the Ford Crown Victoria, synonymous with police cruisers and taxis, and also sold in several variants to the public, such as the Mercury Grand Marquis and Lincoln Town Car from the 1980s through the mid-2000s. Underneath, we can see the coupe's flat four-cylinder engine, to be expected from a 70s-era Super Beetle, as well as a plywood floor plan. While the running gear shows oxidation one might expect from a 70s Volkswagen subjected to a barrage of film production-induced rainfall and subsequent life in the humid Florida climate, these photos, taken 20 years apart, show that the underbody deterioration has more or less been kept as it was and hasn't gotten any worse, regardless of being inside or outside. The car shows few signs of wear and tear, and the wood up in there has held up remarkably well. In fact, the inclusion of the drip tray suggests the car is even still drivable. 
I mentioned earlier that of the five variants of this vehicle that Winfield built, the fates of two are known for sure. The red coupe we see here is living the good life in a climate-controlled museum in arid Southern California. The white police livery version was not so lucky. After the film and publicity tours, it landed at a small car museum in California's San Fernando Valley alongside one of the flying, again air quotes, blue police spinners. As a sidebar, if you have any info on this museum, please do mention in the comments below. Details on this period of the car's life are hazy at best. Sometime around 1987 or 1988, a buyer for Walt Disney Imagineering bought the white livery and the blue police spinner and shipped them off to the then under construction Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida, where it would sit in the tram tour boneyard in a grass field rotting over the next 10 years before both it and the blue flying spinner, one of only four made, were unceremoniously disposed of in 1999. Of the three remaining spinner coupes, the black, blue, and green variants, only this is known for sure. At least one was destined for Florida, along with the red coupe and another one of the blue flying spinners. The trailer upon which the red coupe was being transported was also carrying a flying blue spinner and at least one of the other coupes. Thanks to the internet and all of its facts, and actually in this case I'm pretty sure they're accurate, it is known that during that transport in the early 90s, the flying blue spinner on the transport became unsecured, flying in a bad way off the back of the trailer and utterly destroying the vehicle. And this is the point where I try to fill in the blanks with self-educated speculation until somebody tells me otherwise, and please do comment if you know. The red coupe managed to stay secured, but I theorize the other coupe, be it the black, blue, or green one, came loose and was destroyed as well. I believe that the cars were, at the time, owned by Jay Orberg, another car customizer and picture car coordinator who had purchased the Blade Runner vehicles from Gene Winfield, who had been renting them along with several of his other customs to film productions like Trancers, Solar Crisis, and of course Back to the Future 2, with the intention of flipping them for a profit, which he did by selling them to the American Police Academy Hall of Fame in Miami. Because the sale for two vehicles was never completed due to the accident, Orberg collected on an insurance policy and determined that he could restore at least one of the two vehicles, the Flying Spinner. He did so, buying both cars back from the insurance company and fabricated a mostly new body from scratch for the flying spinner, but also making use of what salvageable parts he could from the wreck spinner coupe of unknown color, especially its hubcaps. This explains why the flying spinner was rolling on wheels covered in hubcaps reserved for the ground coupe cars. He then put the flying spinner on tour with a selection of his other cars. Eventually, Orberg opted to sell the flying spinner, consigning it to Profiles in History, who in turn sold it to Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen who in turn sent it back to Gene Winfield for a complete restoration in order to display it in the Science Fiction Museum, now the Experience Music Project, in Seattle, Washington. Now let's get back to the Red Coop. It continued on its way to the Police Academy Hall of Fame, where it enjoyed relative obscurity through the early 90s until the internet became a thing. Once the Blade Runner fan community got 54 four modems, word spread of its existence, and soon people, like me, were traveling across the country to visit it in a museum that had morbid exhibits like an electric chair and also a Robocop mannequin. After a long stay in Miami, the Peterson Automotive Museum, already a custodian of numerous picture cars from classic films, opted to, for the year 2019, curate a selection of screen-used picture cars from notable sci-fi films, and in doing so, picked up the phone and called the Miami Museum to see if they could get the red coupe back. The placard included with the car indicates that it is displayed courtesy of the American Police Academy Hall of Fame and Museum, with no indication as to whether it will remain in the Peterson's possession or not. My hope is that it does, whether on display or in the vault, as I have more faith in the Peterson's ability to care for, maintain, and document its history than I do the Miami Museum, which most likely bought it to display as a novelty, much like military surplus stores buy gargantuan army vehicles to park outside and draw in customers. For now though, as of 2019, the year the original Blade Runner film takes place, this artifact of classic cinema is well cared for and displayed for the public to view, and that is what is most important. To quote Indiana Jones, and Harrison Ford for that matter, it belongs in a museum and that's where it is.
You can read more about this car and others on display at the Peterson at 20k.com forward slash Hollywood dash dream dash machines. So now we're left wondering, where are the other two coupes, really? Thanks for watching this first documentary video on 20,000 Things. I'll be making more in the future, and I appreciate your support. See you in the next one, and have a great week.